just got uh, done setting up a beautiful uh, Dia de Muertos altar at Ritual Craft. Uh, seeing you go through the process of actually building it uh, from the ground up, uh, I had vivid flashbacks of my youth, uh, being a kid and seeing my mother set it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother basically giving me the space to decide things. Uh, to orientate things like flowers. Your son was with you uh, yeah. while you were setting it up. Uh, you know, people that, are, that just watch this process uh, won't get to smell, won't get to, to hear some of the lessons as it was being built. Um, on my end, it was, uh, it was like home again, you know, for a moment, if only for a moment. But for people that might not know who you are uh, or your story, I think we're, we're, it would be great if you had a, if you could introduce yourself uh, to our audience. Yeah. <laughs> so my name is Lisa Martinez, and on my mother's side, I'm the granddaughter of Evilia Duran Madrid and Antonio Padilla Arroyos, and I come from. A complicated background so I identify as mestiza so there's lots of mixedness in there uh, I was a really young mom and just um, I've just been on a journey that led me to here and it's been complex and beautiful and yeah. The, the, the work you do, and uh, well, we're going to go deeper into that, but uh, the way we met, a yeah. uh, common friend of ours, uh, mm -hmm. Moses, yeah. you know, he, uh, he let me know of your work. Um, and for people that kind of been following along my journey, I've been, I, I did a lot of work that uh, did a lot of damage, not only to my body, but my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been a journey and a process for myself to seek out and find not only healing for myself, but also healing for other people that uh, might be on the same boat. Because mm -hmm. I, always, I always like to tell people that this uh, whole Ed's Manifesto thing is basically a ride along with me as I go through my journey, right? Yeah. Uh, Moses uh, spoke about your work in healing uh, and specifically in your work around trauma. Yeah. Now, I just got done uh, talking to a uh, SEAL Team uh, 6, uh, damn neck, uh, Navy SEAL, ex-Navy SEAL operator. That's probably the most boring thing about him. Uh, he takes people off into the wilderness for 41 days and uh, lets them work with horses. And I just, you know, and he's, you know, he went through the process of kind of discovering that for himself. And I'm like, wow, you, you're basically doing what other people have been doing for, for centuries when it comes to healing and working mm -hmm. like that with people. Now, can you uh, talk a little bit about that, uh, that, that the, the medicine, the work you do around uh, trauma? Yeah, you know, I think it takes someone to understand what trauma really is to be able to actually work with it. Someone who basically has been through the dark tunnels and says, I, I know where there's some lights along the way. Um, I might have one in my back pocket. You want to go with me and we can do this together. I feel like the trauma work is really never one that is done alone. It's one that we do together. Um, you know, my experience, I think my life, my lived experience uh, is what gave me the, I, the tools Frankly, the so, tools. So when people talk about uh, you know, the shamanic experience and uh, basically people that go into the underworld and come back mm -hmm. with a description of basically basically people have to go through a process themselves where they die in a way. Is that, uh, is that the equivalent of basically having an experience in trauma mm -hmm. and then bringing back that experience to, yeah. to, to work with people? Yes. I think anytime anyone has ever experienced trauma where they feel like this is it, this is the last time I'm going to see this glimmer of light or this is my death right now. Uh, if you can bring back whatever your experience was in that moment and then transform it. It's the transformation that's key because we can bring it back. But then if we stay in it and we look at it and we we roll in it and we're constantly just. You're talking about PTSD. Yeah. Then we're not. 
that you're not moving you're forward. You're not moving forward. It's the transformation. Um, you just you basically we, 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 you basically just described the 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 conflict that a lot of uh, up people like myself and uh, you know people out there that uh, you wouldn't understand. You weren't there. You went. You didn't go through it. And all of a sudden, you have your you yeah you have the only tools that people like myself get sometimes is a. Uh, you know, somebody that just went through, uh, you know, psych psychology school, he's trying to figure things out, he went through a few courses, and um, his solutions are uh, pharmaceuticals that mm -hmm. make you feel like a zombie, and uh, uh, processes that are seen completely out of base or out of touch with my experience. Right. Um, have you experienced that kind of conflict with people coming to you that have been through the regular channels of... of, of uh, yeah, I'm usually the last stop. Which I'm literally usually the last stop. I'm the one that they say, I've tried everything else. I don't know what else to do. I'm desperate, and I'm not sure if I believe in this shit, <laughs> but I'm going to give it a try. And when you say, I don't, I'm not sure I believe in this shit, do you think it's, uh, well, I mean, my experience with, with, uh, with some of this. Um, you know, I went through my process, and the first thing I did was, uh, you know, I got an MRI. I learned what PTSD was, TBI, mm -hmm. all these things. I, wow, I have language for these things now. Sure, huh? But in a way, I also had I had a name for the shackles, and I was like, oh, this is the this is what I have, and this is my identity now. In a way, yeah, but that's the problem. Which is a which is which is a problem, <laughs> right? Uh, um, medication was what I was introduced to, and it uh, it was you know medication and self medication, you know alcohol. Uh, prescription pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. um, when I met you, I was probably a year into my sobriety, and I think you could see that in me. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Miles Davis says uh, sobriety is every day. You know, uh, when I met you, we we got to meet briefly. Basically, I was here for a moment. I had to go to the airport. Yeah, uh, but we had a. Corazón to corazón, you know, mm -hmm. talk. Um, and for people that don't understand what your work is like or what it's about, um, I, I remember learning a little bit about it, you know, and saying, when I come back, Lisa, right? <laughs> I'm, yeah. go I'm going to allow myself to go through it with you, which mm -hmm. we're talking about being nervous about things. You right, know? yeah. <laughs> uh, can you describe what that work is like for people that might view this as a complete dark unknown? They don't know what's going on. They don't. Yeah. They'll see you. They'll see some of your practices, and they'll see, well, is this for me? Is this allowed for me? And yeah. do I have access? Can you describe a little bit of what that process would be like? Yes. Usually, when people first come in, we have that corazón, the corazón, the plática. We have that conversation that says. Why are you here? Yeah. You know, people don't don't come to see me because they're having a good day ever. I, I don't never. And so it's an opportunity for them to sit and literally lay it all out there. We go as deep as they want. Yeah. You know, some people come in with one thing. Some people come in with the whole story. And my my job in that moment is to listen to them and really talk about what happened because I think about some of the things that are missed often in, in some of the therapeutic worlds is they talk a lot about how you feel. They don't take a look at uh, what happened to you. Yeah. Can you pinpoint the moment when things shifted for you? And we also, we look at people, body, mind, spirit. In my work, the, we don't separate the, the mind. We don't separate the body. We don't separate the spirit. The spirit. That can... That can for me, the amputation of the spirit in Pratt and in, in the tradition and well, and the regular avenues of therapy is what I've I remember not seeing it or not experiencing that. Mm -hmm. So, spirit, you know, what is that? Yeah. What is spirit about? You know, spirit is really that animating force of our existence. We have our mind, we have our thought processes, we have our emotions, we have this physical suit that we're driving around in every day. But our spirit is really what animates us. The ghost inside of the machine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it uh, is. It is. And the spirit doesn't, it can't truly ever be defeated. There is always 
opportunity for it to really rise again or for it to come forward in its best form, in its complete form. Sometimes we have pieces of ourselves that have been maybe separated based on experience, but it's never gone. Yeah. You know? And so when we know that the spirit is out of balance, we know that we can start to have physical manifestations and mental manifestations. And this comes from La Plática, the first uh, interaction you have with people coming in here. Mm -hmm. uh, do you basically develop a map as far as what, you're gonna, what your work is going to look like based on that initial Plática? Yeah, yes, for sure. Uh, once we come to an agreement about what this next focus piece is going to be, then we go into the actual physical work. And that involves a whole series of spirit-guided steps on what's going to happen next, but it, asking permission to really get into the spirit of the individual, opening up. We have doorways on our body, and if we can open those doorways, we have 13 doorways. Allow me to open those 13 doorways and reach inside. I think a lot of your work is about... Uh Trying to put uh, trying to put a physical uh, aspect to something that's internal. So you talk about thirteen doorways yeah. into the body. You 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 describe it as a way to access an individual. Can you talk about those thirteen doorways? So when we talk about what we're experiencing with the doorways and with the winds, we're really addressing things that are often unseen or not tangible. They're having to do with the spirit and. When we work with individuals, we're asking them to allow us to go into that space and see what's between the worlds, not of this world, but of the other world, so that we can do the work. So for somebody that might uh, not know how to put words to that and that they, you know, that haven't been exposed to, we're talking about maybe the subconscious for some people that uh, their mind is talking to them, they just have no way of communicating to that unconscious mind in a way, right. in, in some aspect, I think, is, is, is yeah. also an interesting way of putting it. But we compartmentalize a lot, oh, right? Uh, well, our culture and now makes us amputate our unconscious with our, with our conscience, right? right? And then I think a lot of the work you do is about not only connecting both of those. Right. And figuring out what's in there, you know. Mm -hmm. And for somebody like me, and you say, "Hey, Ed, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a conversation with you, and then I'm gonna put you into a situation where you're, where we have a conversation with you." Yes. That's yes. A, that's a scary thing for me. Like I don't, right. I don't like myself. I don't want to have a conversation with myself. What are you doing? Right. Um, the physical aspect of the things you do to work on somebody that people, you know, will see. You know, uh, we live in a current resurgence of people trying to get back into ancestor work, uh, people trying to reconnect with something that is greatly missing from our society right now. Yes. Um, you see people that try to piece together <laughs> what they find online or find in a book and or what's easy. Uh, I just saw your son not only not only create fire but keep it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I saw him select certain pieces of uh, specific pieces of uh, carbon, you know, which is a good guy. He was touching like this one's pretty good, this one's bad, this one's pretty good. It's like looking at him. All of a sudden, he makes a fire really quickly and it keeps. Now, I've, I've been through survival training. I know what that is. That's not an easy skill. Right. I've never seen it applied to the spirit work, but it's spirit spiritual work. But it's it's beautiful to see that. There's skeptical people out there. There's analytical minds that see some of these things, and I've, again, I've, I've, I've been there as well. Um, the work you do, uh, using smoke, using obsidian, um, sound, um, can you describe the, the process that somebody like myself would go through while we start working on the actual that side of it, after the platica? Yeah. From my perspective, when, when I ask the permission to put my hands on your body, yeah. I physically actually go and place my hands and apply certain methodologies to open those doors. 
And usually in that space, individuals are still in this, in this you know, what is happening? It's a, it's a survival mode. Right. Like uh, before, before you continue on, if somebody's ever been through any traumatic experience where hands were on you, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden hands are on you, I think you're describing the way exposure therapy. Like mm-hmm. in, 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 in some sense, or at least what it was and is coming back in a lot of ways with the people. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of the therapy that I've seen is basically a rediscovery, a half-assed rediscovery of some of the work that people used to do on other people. You know, and that's, it's so valuable because if we have individuals who've experienced domestic violence, for example, we lose the idea of what it means to be touched gently. I can remember the very first time that I sat with a curandera many years ago and I never allowed anybody to put their hands on me for any reason because of my experiences in life and I felt so uncomfortable and then I remember feeling so uptight Clinch. and almost almost like I needed to fight because it was so uncomfortable. And all she was doing was applying, you know, pomada in the, in, literally in the sweetest way. She was rubbing it on my arm and she said to me, Hermana, has nobody ever touched you like a sister, like with kindness? And of course they had, my grandmother, my mom, you know, but it had been so long that it was, I and I left there and sobbed and felt horrible, actually, for a really long time. And I didn't let anybody else touch me for years. Yeah. For years. Because it was it was so shocking. And also, you, you, some people just never had that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough to have a mother. Some people have mothers, but not complete mothers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so I was lucky enough to have a father. Some people don't have that. Um, the, ability to, the ability to allow yourself just to be soothed physically. Right. It is, you know, you, you, you uh, as a war fighter coming back, that's, that's, that's programmed out of you. you you're right. not that. Like, what? Uh, you, you see this in fighting dogs. I, I uh, used to run an animal rescue in Tijuana, mm. and we would bring fighting dogs in. And you can't touch them. You know, they'll fight you tooth and nail. And uh, uh, my ex-wife, one of the first things that she would kind of do was uh, try and make contact. Completely just something that she decided that was the way, right? I would look at that. I was not capable of that because my mindset was in defense. If that dog bites you, I'll shoot it. You know, mm-hmm. that was me, you know? <laughs> yeah. But women have that in them more so, I think, than a lot of men, that aspect. These dogs would come in angry, betrayed, programmed to fight, programmed to bite. I'm not saying that men are or any veteran is a dog, but we are, in a way, war is dogs war. I remember learning a lesson from that dog. Uh, as soon as contact happened and the perception of threat was gone, uh, these dogs would sleep for two days sometimes. I can imagine. I can, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm trying to equate some of this so yeah. people can understand what that uh, process might be like. Uh, you, people out there will see, you know, sage being burned. Uh, they'll see, you know, people playing instruments, you know, yeah. uh, some people have appropriated some of those things and don't do it in, in, in ways that are maybe not, uh, you know, I see purpose in any, I see, I, I, as soon as we got to that, uh, to ritual craft where we posted, uh, where we will help you out with, uh, the altar, there was purpose in every single thing that you did. Right. Um, and I think, uh, the work you do with the healing work, that's, that's 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 what separates it, I think, as far as what I've seen other people do. That purpose behind it, you know. So you you lay hands on with a purpose. Uh, what what are some of the meanings behind uh, smoke, fire? Uh, why 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 add those elements? What do they do? Right. The smoke is really a transitional 
it helps us recognize that we're transitioning into a different space. We're in a different space now. We're in a different zone. We're in a different realm. Why, why don't you tell me? What, what, why doesn't it register if you say, hey, Ed, we're in a different space. Why, does, why do I have to have this cue? Right. right. I think a, a lot of it is, truthfully, we have forgotten. Yes. We have forgotten. Yeah. We're taking the blood of our trees, the copal, that is our literal ancestral, just like the blood that flows through our body. We're taking this offering of the sacrifice. We're applying it to fire. And now we're asking this fire to sit in our heart, to sit in our hands. We're watching and witnessing our prayers lifted. It's a literal connection between heaven and earth. The heart of the heaven and the heart of the earth coming together. And that fragrance, that smell, we can get into all the science of it. I, 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 but it shifts our mind. Yes. Immediately we recognize something's different. So uh, going to a psychiatrist and putting yourself on a couch. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a physical manifestation of a, now we need to work on something. Yeah. You don't have a couch. Uh, no. <laughs> you have... Uh, a space, yeah. uh, you have a table that should shift people into the process. Oh, now I need to work on things. And for people trying to equate some of the elemental stuff you're doing with smoke, I mean, I've gone through therapy myself. Hey, Ed, draw yourself in the rain. And you draw that out. And then you look at what you drew, and then you're like, oh, why is my fist clenched? Right. Or, or, or why don't I have a, an umbrella? And what I learned from that is a lot of times we just need physical, elemental cues outside of ourselves to be able to see within, which yeah. I think a lot of ancestor, or a lot of our ancestors actually did. That's, that's, that was the main part of their work. When you take somebody through that process, um, you know, resistance. Uh, resistance through different means like I'll, I'll go through mine you know first off is unbelief or skept uh, being skeptical mm -hmm. because medicine is sour and I don't want to swallow it right right um, people fighting back maybe now I, I, th that type of work I you you, you like I, I imagine it's not easy right um, what do you do with somebody like that that has a, you know, comes to you with a need for help, but there is a resistance there? Like, how do you how do you deal with that resistance that people get? Usually, it takes time. It takes time, and it takes a lot no, of. I trust. want to do it in an hour. I want yeah. to be. I want to come in here and do an yeah. hour with you and leave here enlightened. Hey, you know, sometimes, but. <laughs> there is a shift typically in the process from the moment that we start. When my spirit taps into your spirit, there's a shift. And usually there's a conversational piece that sparks while we're on the table, while you're on the table, where a question comes up. When I say, have you ever or did you ever? And I see immediately a shift in a person's body when they say, how do you know that? And then... There's a release, and I, I think... I mean, there's a vulnerability and nakedness, and all of a sudden somebody discovering or voicing something that is, how right. do you know? Right, and you know, I, I always tell people, like, I'm not psychic, I'm not a medium, that's not what I do. I come in here, and we pray, and we do this work together. The experience is for you, and, and when I say that we're working, we're working. It's not spotty, right? And so... That's the, disc the f disclosure disclaimer when people come in the door. You came in here and said, I'm aware that something is going to happen today. I don't know what it is. And I'm saying, we'll go as far as you can, yeah. as far as you're ready. But in that space, there's a shift. Yes. I can't explain the shift. I don't know when the shift happens specifically because it's different for everyone. But in that moment... There's a sudden release, there's a sudden opening, a question is asked, and there's a pause. Is it surrender what you're talking about? Yeah, that's the way. 
Thank you. Yeah, that is the word. It's surrender. Uh, that I was trained for years to survive and to kill somebody that tried to do anything to me that would make me surrender. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to give up. You're talking about giving up. That's not something I want. Is it giving up, or I don't know. is it? It's, 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 it, 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 yeah. I, I'm voicing the yeah, process the, that yeah. some of us might have. Uh, you know, uh, domestic battery. I'm going to go to Krav Maga and a jiu-jitsu yeah. and I'm going to be a badass and everybody wants to try that again and get some, you know, fight them. But also, I'm going to trap myself in myself and nobody's going to get close. And my question to you is still, is it giving up or is it making a decision to do it different? That's a great question. Because in reality, in those moments, would, there were always options. Even if you didn't think there was options, there was always an option. There was always a different option than one we had, and we have those same options right now. And so when people say, I don't want to give up, I don't want to stop feeling this, I do want to start feeling that, whatever This is my is. identity. Yeah, this is my identity. I'm okay. a PTSD, so my PTSD guy, I'm, I'm right. survived this, I'm a veteran, I'm a... How, uh, do you like carrying that? How heavy is that bag? I know, but, but that's who I am. You know, and so are you ready to do it different? Because if you're ready to do it, if you're ready to do it different, then then we can move forward. Because you can still be you. You can still be everything that you love. You can still identify in certain ways from your past experience. But you don't have to identify through the wound. You don't have to identify through the pain. You don't have to identify as if, if, if being I'm, weak because you surrendered. If I'm not the guy that survived and the wounds define me. Uh, you know, I have, I've, I've said this a few times and um, it, may be, it may be untrue. I hope it is, you know. Uh, one of the biggest lies that was ta told to me is that I'm gonna get back to normal and that I'm going to heal, mm. right? And I viewed, it, I viewed it as a betrayal or as a, a lie that made me not trust people when they told me, I'm going to get back to normal. Like, what is normal, you know? Mm -mm. Uh, you're going to heal. How can I heal this experience that I went through that uh, not only cost me people in my life, uh, it cost me an innocence in a way, uh, or... Um, a state of being that I can no longer, or at least that is my perception, that I can no longer get back to. And it causes you sleep. It causes you uh, self-medication problems. You know, I, for me, it was alcohol. And then it yeah. was psychiatric uh, medication to try and figure that out. And then other things to try and mask other things. Um, is, is healing possible? Yes, but I also feel like people have these ideas of what healing is that are sometimes unrealistic. We talk a lot about healing being very complicated. Yeah. We can heal into life, we can heal into death, and there's any version of healing in between. And I think, you know, this idea that we're going to heal and we're going to be, you know, flowers and roses and unicorns and whatever else there is, for me, the understanding of healing is very much like when we talk about Clasoteo, Clasoteo is one of the one of the deities, right, of the old, uh, the, our old gods that says, I'm going to take all of this shit, just like the vultures that eat the rotting meat, and I'm going to transform it, and we're going to make it something different. We're going to put it to good use. And when we look at healing, we're no longer looking at it from the perspective of being this shiny, new, high-polished being. We're now looking at it as a person who has a scar, who has a scar that now has purpose. And the way that one of our Maestas talks about the jewel in the wound. The you know, jewel in the wound. The jewel in the wound, yes. Yeah, that comes from our Maestra, Dr. Estes, uh -huh. who... Uh, Lorca was the was the poet that yeah. talked about the jewel in the wound, and I think that that's something very, for me, that resonates a whole lot because nobody can be stitched up clean, right? We're never going to be free from the scar, and so what good use can we put it to now? 
That's a, that's a, that's a beautiful way to think about it. Uh, finding purpose in the scar. Mm-hmm. Now, how can you help me find that? How could you help me find that purpose? And in, 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 how can I find the jewel in my wound? How, you know, what, how can you help me find that? I think a lot of us are already doing the work, and we don't realize it. A lot of us have already put forward the things that we want. And I see that already in you and what you're doing and some of the offerings that I've heard you talk about with other individuals. Uh, one of the comadres that was there that particular evening, I know that you talked to her about doing some work yeah. around um, the missing and murdered indigenous women. Yeah. Teaching them how to protect themselves. Yeah. You know, I don't think that you see that as the jewel in the wound, but it is the jewel in the wound. And you getting to the place of recognizing that it is embracing it and seeing that good good purpose is coming from you yeah. is where it is. And you do it over and over and over again all the time. I see it all the time. And those are the jewels. The difficult part is not whether or not we're doing it. It's whether or not we own that we're doing it. Yeah. And if you don't take ownership of it, you can't protect what's now healed. You have to own it in order to keep that healing. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I was in Acapulco recently, and in a damn like horrible bathroom. The Acapulco wasn't wasn't what it used to be. In a damn like horrible bathroom. Uh, I just I just dug out myself from probably two months of deep depression. Uh, sober, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> yeah. Not an easy thing. Um, there was a, somebody wrote on the wall, uh, "Midnights of the soul will take you to middays of the heart." You know, I uh, I've been going through a midnight of the soul that has been you know a few years long. Um, I have moments like uh, like all of us do. Um, I think a big part of my process has been my moments are so short and fleeting. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a there's a moment in the process that people like myself go through where you you talk about uh, taking experiences like my own and then making them into lessons for other people, maybe, mm -hmm. or trying to do something positive over a negative. I mean, I went through twelve years of a pretty dark, uh, dark negative. Uh, but somewhere along that line, for people like myself, you got selfish, you know? Like, when is it gonna be my turn to just kind of chill out and not work? Um, when is it gonna be my opportunity to have this, this happiness, apparently, that I'm helping other people achieve, or this empowerment uh, that other people are getting? Uh, and there's a conflict in that for people like myself because that's not who we are. We are not selfish. We can't. We, that's the conflict for people like that. Now, with the work you do, you know, the conversations we're having, you know, and the, we, the ones we had before, you, you talk about a lot of a lot of the times we get lied to or we have a delusional impression of what getting healed is. Mm -hmm or what getting to a better place is. Now in my mind, a better place is being able to sleep all, like a, like, like a full night, you know? Uh, being able to not uh, get triggering events that uh, will push me back into a cycle of self-destruction, self-neglect, self-hate, you know? Right. Uh, where do I go with it? How, how do you point somebody like myself into a direction of, hey, this isn't heaven that you're going to, but it is, it is a place. What is that place? Yeah, sometimes I feel like that place is really already in front of us a lot of the times. But the darkest darkness is so, like, it's so dark that when we have those moments of light, it feels like they're this big. Yeah. Because even in those moments of light, we're looking backwards and we're saying, but what, when's the dark coming back? When's the dark coming back? And so we have to re 
there's an anxiety there. As soon as you get a little light, you're like, oh, but this is just for a minute. It's not forever. It's just temporary. And we really have to learn to recognize that when those moments of light come, that we live fully in those moments. Be present. Fully, 100%. In fact, I think a really perfect example of that happened on the drive here. We got a phone call. Yeah. Right? The kid was talking, my kid was talking to me over the phone. Right, and she's saying, I'm really sorry I was eating and I couldn't give you my full attention. And she called me back. So she called you back. (laughs) And she gives you a perfect example of living in that moment and being fully present. She's teaching you every single day. Oh, yeah, she's a great teacher. (laughs) You know, and so in that moment, you were not looking backwards and saying, the dark is coming, the dark is coming, it's right behind me. In that moment, you were totally in love with the moment and elated that she called you back. You were talking to her about what you were eating, the whole experience that we were having, and what you were going to do the rest of the day, and there was literally nothing else. It's like, like, yeah, you try to hold on to that. Right? And we can hold on to that because, you know, those moments, those moments are everywhere. Yeah. But even in those moments, we're so busy waiting, anticipating, counting on. Yeah. So we thrive, we thrive and are dependent on the scaffolding of our trauma. So we have to look at what your secondary gain is. What are we getting out of staying in that brokenness? Because we do get something. Yeah. Yeah. um, When I, uh, when I went to a lady uh, that worked on me and uh, I think it was Guadalajara. uh, Yeah, it was in Guadalajara. And uh, she gave me a saint, you know, Medio Mi Santo. She said, ah, San Lázaro. Mm. San Lázaro? I was like, mm. why San Lázaro? I, he didn't have a say in getting brought back to life. Right. <laughs> and you look better to be alive. You know, she said that. Um, it's funny. Uh, is it, but he also had a sense of humor, just like you. I was like, oh. Yeah, San Lázaro only said a single uh, sentence after he was brought back to life and before he died a second time. Uh, and it was at a moment where a man stole a potted plant in front of him. And he laughed and said, soil stealing soil. Mm. Uh, and that was funny to him. Um, the, uh, there was an anger and a rage uh, with survival that sometimes comes with it. Uh, survival's guilt. Uh, I buried a lot of friends that didn't make it. Uh, people that were way better than me. Survivor guilt. Uh, feeling unworthy of being here. Uh, you know, Many of my friends who were service members have that. Uh, experiencing uh, their friends, you know, not coming back Mm -hmm. or not feeling worthy of the opportunity to continue on. I I bury many friends. Uh, Some of them, uh, you know, some of them vividly live with me like ghosts in a way. Um, I I remember the the moments uh, that you have to delete uh, phone numbers, or they don't come with you after you change phones. Right. Um, I was 23 years old when I had my first uh, situation where I had to inform somebody about a death. Like, I wasn't ready for it, nobody prepared me for it. Uh, right. Uh, death wasn't something that was. Uh, talked about or prepared for uh, when it came to the job that I was doing. And what good would the user manual do? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. You know? You know, I just wasn't ready for it. Uh, it was a process. I wish I knew how to process some of these things before I went into that. And I wish I had elders that taught me this. Yeah. I wish I had people behind me that could show me what grief is, you know? You know all I had was uh, somebody handing me the phone and say, hey, 
The guy that's shot over there? Yeah, this is his mom. Can you tell him what mm -hmm. to happen? Mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, this house, shanty houses in Tijuana. We get there, uh, blood is rolling down the parking lot, parking whole side. Well, there's shell casings all over the place. Kids are grabbing the shell cases from the ground, but not the ones that are on the, on the blood. You know, they're leaving mm -hmm. those alone. Uh, kids are still, the music's still playing. You know, these kids were just, you know, wannabe guys. You know, they're just there. Uh, it was cold, so you can you can still feel the warmth coming out of them. Um, uh, as soon as we got there, you know, we were armed, so everybody said, "Oh, it's safe to come out and look at the bodies." You know, so the kids started picking up the shell casings and you know, you know, standing there looking at the scene, uh, taking pictures with a digital camera, and uh, my training. Uh, is about dehumanizing, so these people are not people. And then uh, the ladies of the community come out and start saying the holy mysteries over their bodies. Mm -hmm. And that brought me back to humanity, you know. Uh, among them, one of them came over and handed me a phone. And said, are you, are you a police officer? Yeah. I'm a fucking kid, I'm nobody. Oh, uh, the mother of that boy over there, so can you tell, tell her what happened? And I don't remember what I said in that phone call, but I do remember her screams. Yeah. Um, there's an unworthiness and a guilt in a lot of people that go off into a war setting like that or that do things that are outside of what anybody's put somebody to into to just, hey, you. Basic training is basic. Yeah. Uh, survival skill. Mm-hmm. We... Wow, wow. Oh, they're fine. Us. They're okay. Forgive me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How can you put somebody into just, hey, you. We are put on this earth for a reason. We don't choose what that reason is. So... When we're put in these roles and these positions, we're basically told what we're going to do. And we carry them out because we're compliant and we don't question and we don't, and we, we're just going. And then one day or one moment, we're experiencing listening to those women and it pulls us back from our duty or our instruction or wherever it is. And we realize that suddenly now, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? We, we question everything in that moment. And then we go back to that same cycle. We have to remember, again, still, that we're put on this earth for a reason. And it may have been that, because you don't know how many people benefited from the work, how many people were protected as a result of that. How many lives were saved, even though many were lost? There are too many intricate pieces involved in all of the whys. We have to recognize that we're one small piece in all of that. And it is one place when it comes to forgiveness that I always go back to. And... I can't remember who taught me this, honestly, but they told me forgiveness is nothing more than letting go of the idea of a better past. And when I realized that, okay, they're, we're looking for some great process of like, okay, here we are, self. We're good now, self. Yeah. I love you. We're cool. I love you, self. Rudy, yeah, like we've been through some shit, but I got you now. And, and this... Oh, elated, rising. Yeah. It doesn't happen like that. It is literally letting go of the idea of a better past. Forgiveness is nothing else. And we look back and say, yeah, that shit happened. That shit was, it was fucked up. I don't know if I can say that. You can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was fucked up. It is part of that. And that's what it, my experience was. But that's not my experience now. I'm transforming. 
I'm taking that shit and I'm putting it into good use now. And that is the process. That literally is the process of forgiveness. It, it, moving forward is key. One thing, one thing every day that says to yourself, I'm alive. I see the light, I, the sun. Yeah. The sun is risen today just for me. Right? And our sun sometimes is our children. The sun sometimes is the literal sun. The sun sometimes is that smell of coffee in the morning that reminds you oh, of your yeah. mom yeah. or your grandma. Those moments that we stitch together, literal stitching together, each of those things throughout the day and then the next day and then the next day. And before you know it, we now have a week where we've stitched together multiple pieces of transformation. One thing that we've done yeah. turns into many. And before you, the next long period of goes by, you realize it's been a whole month since you were looking back and thinking, this, the darkness is coming. It's just behind me. It's a coming right now. It's about to happen. The When you get to the place where you wake up and realize how many days you've stitched together, the darkness gets further and further behind you. Yeah. You know, that's what forgiveness and that's what healing and that's what transformation honestly looks like. And small changes, they add up, they add up. They really do. And I, I do like to refer to them as stitching because for me, when I think about, I felt like there were times in my life where everything was so unraveled. Like my Oroboso was literally like, maybe if I had two or three loops, and now, what am I going to do with this? And where do I even start? The overwhelming sense of it's not... It's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. And, and thinking today, okay, I'm just going to do, you know, two or three, two or three loops, two or three loops, and then the next day. And eventually it's done. Yeah. You know, but the whole thing too is that we still have to, we're still going to cycle back. We're still going to go through... The calamity is still a possibility. Yeah. We're, you know, maybe we don't sleep a whole night, but the, the time that we are sleeping is good sleep. You know, maybe uh, we still go into a depression, but it's not for two months, it's for two days. You know, and those have value, and they're never given enough value. You know, we have to really, um, it's realistic. It's yeah. keeping it super realistic. Yeah. You know, it's like, man, last time I was out for, you know, four months, and now I'm just like, this was a really bad week. I'm somebody that has no idea what this work looks like, and I want to start. Stitching. We're just going to stitch it. The first change you do in your life, what's that? What's that look like? What's the first thing you would do? The first change? Yeah, I'm a I'm a alcoholic, uh, recently divorced, former veteran of a weird ass war, and I'm stepping off into a journey of like I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, what's my first move? Man. <laughs> You know what? It really depends on the person. But if it had to be, I don't know. I found like folks that go through that kind of stuff can't even do basics, man. I mean, I'm serious. It's like go take a shower. Go take a shower. I'm serious. Start with that. But but now take your shower with intention. Now take your shower and say, today I'm cleaning this shit off. Like a medicine, like a medicine, this I'm treat like a medicine. Yeah, I'm but but that's new age. Why, that's, that's what, not what are you, new age. What are you talking about? That's, that's you're talking about nonsense now. That's Come on, not new age. What, but it's there now. You have intention behind what you're actually. You're not going to just buy a bottle of uh, Old Spice. Heck no. no. I'm going to come to somebody that knows about some of these things like you, and you're going to yeah, we're help gonna... me figure out exactly right. what that bath is like. Yeah, you know when people. When I tell them, take your shower with intention, and they're like, yeah, it's new age. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Curanderas have been doing baños outside yeah. in the backyard forever. I've, I've, I've had a few buckets dumped on me. Right. So I know what that is. Yeah. But I, uh, for me, it's a, 
if you don't do things with intention and the things that are being done to you or put on you are not don't have an intention realistically yeah you know and i'll be really honest i think the word intention is is it lacks you okay. know i talk with one of my comadres about it all the time intention is just it's like overused and it's like action it's take action you know and and say tell what is going to happen next if i'm so, going to take a bath with these verbs i'm going to have to gather them you, yeah you got to gather them you put them in the bathtub you have to say the prayers you have to put you them have in to and speak. It's just, you have yeah. to man, you have to speak you, what, into, into reality into reality what is going to happen you're, you're talking like a psychologist now you know, yeah you're gonna get i'm gonna get better or like an a and a meeting i'm not gonna i'm an alcoholic the first step is admitting admitting right that the direct ancestor of every action is a thought exactly and that is not any sort of mumbo jumbo out there i guess no but what you're speaking of is that. change your thought move a muscle isn't that that's part of the whole you know if we put it into modern terms but there was a reason why these things were done in the past there was mm -hmm. a reason why our warriors came back and sweated there was a reason why our women were a part of the welcoming back yeah you know yeah. I mean, at least that's something that I've rediscovered for myself. It's true. Because one of the things that we cling to, or one of the many things that we know that we cling to after a significant amount of loss and death is life. Yeah. We want that. Yeah. And so if we're welcomed with that. Welcomed with life instead of death. <laughs> welcomed with life instead of death. I feel like there's there's a huge opening right there. What enters the opening? Because we're blown. We can be blown wide open in trauma just as much as we can be blown wide open when we experience true love. Yeah. You know, from from a friend, from our family, wherever it may be. That opening. What enters that opening in that moment? Those wounds, I feel, honestly makes all the difference in the world between how that person moves forward um, or doesn't. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, it's to me, the way that our warriors were welcomed was everything, you know, to be greeted with food, with flowers, with hugs, with cariño, you know, with all of the, the nourishment, the bathing, the cleansing away, the honoring, the speaking back your name, your true name, not the one that you wore on your, on your gear. But your true name, the one that your mom called you, the one that your abuela called you. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, again, uh, I went back to my conversation I just had with uh, my SEAL friend who, who runs a, who runs this uh, Heroes for Horses program. And one of the first things he talks about is a lot of veterans out there that come to this program. And the first thing, like, who are you? I'm a veteran. Mm -hmm. Are you a veteran? Uh, like, is that who you are? Uh, who am I? You know, and uh, I think we lose who we are because that is not a part of the thing we are trained for, right. some of us. Uh, and also, you know, trauma survivors, trauma victims, some of them are people that are very much people pleasers or people that suffer from abandonment issues. And if you're selfless, you're selfless, right? So we lose ourselves uh, during that process. I'm sorry, I'm having just a moment because <laughs> my dad, my dad was a veteran of uh, Vietnam and he did the Heroes Helping Heroes program. Yeah. Horses. My yeah. dad was all about the horses. And um, one of the things that you can say about my dad, as traumatized and as complex as he was, he was so selfless that the the entire community that's the, all they knew him as was the man who helped absolutely everyone and we can yeah. we can edit that no. out i just had to <laughs> pause for a moment yeah. and say like oh whoa you just yeah you have to i don't know that i ever really acknowledge like recognized that that was yeah you lose yourself you don't know I, who you are i mean i did but hearing it out loud was different yeah. this time so uh, identity, who we are, uh, that whole, 
you know, you talk to anybody uh, like that's been through some of the things that I've been through or some of the things that people are being alone with ourselves is. Yeah. Uh, you know, put me in a room full of people because they keep me from thinking about my own bullshit, you know, or uh, substances so I can hide. Yeah. From who? And who are you hiding from with these, right. these tequila shots? From, from me. From myself. Yeah. What I miss the most about uh, getting drunk every two or three nights is the dead, dreamless sleep. And uh, I remember the first few months of sobriety, how clear myself was to myself. You know, I could see myself. And I was like, oh, look at this guy. Yeah, you know, Gollum in the cave. Yeah. Uh, obsessed with the ring. Um, uh, frailty, nakedness. Uh, how do you provide somebody like that with strength? What's, 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 what, what, community? But what is strength? What is strength to you? What, is, what is strength? What does that look like? Uh, well, I see strength in other people sometimes. Like what? What? Um, you know, I have a, a friend who went through a, his own uh, war. His war was basically at home. He had a man that wasn't his father beat him almost to death several times uh, during his uh, time growing up. Uh, murdered his smaller brother. Uh, survived that somehow. Uh, went into substance abuse. Was into heroin. Locked himself in a hotel. Got off that. And has a family of five kids. Beautiful, strong woman next to him. And he gets to go home. Strength to me is being able to go home, okay, I guess. Where's home? Home is a person for me right now. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you know, I've been on the run, <laughs> you know, traveling around. Uh, it's hard to go back home. And also, home is not how you left it. So I think uh, when you ask me, like, what does strength look like? I think strength is somebody that has the ability to find a home and keep it, is what I would say. Uh, and it's hard for me to figure that out. That's what I would say. You talked about all of these different individuals as people who were strong and had these specific attributes. Yeah. And this idea that there's an unattainable place, yeah. an unattainable home for you. Or, yeah, it's, it seems to me like but, you can't reach it. But what I've experienced of you yeah. and what I've witnessed of you, you have that every day with that sweet little one all the time. Yeah. We're always seeking something that's literally right in front of us. And we're always looking for a definition of it yeah. that is created somewhere in our mind, I or guess we're so. like, like a weird lie, <laughs> like you're getting, you're gonna get, you're gonna get back to normal, maybe. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And I think while we're out there looking for it, we're totally missing it because it's sitting right in front of us. Yeah. I remember one day I was talking with you, and you had like seven different juices. Right? Yeah. And yeah. you were talking about, like, it's just a thing. Which, it's like. Yeah, we, we, we go to this uh, juice shop and uh, my, with my kid, and she's like, I don't know which one to pick. Let's get all of them and try them out. That's so the one ridiculous, of my. Ridiculous uh, <laughs> line of weird juices. And we're like, oh, this sucks. You know, this one's good. Yeah. We, yeah, we, that, that, was a, that was a moment in the, in the sun for me. Those are actually, those are almost identical moments that I love my son and I go and we'll get those things and have five or six different drinks still to this day because yeah. it's, it's, it is those moments of home and laughter and beauty that those are them. Yeah. They're literally right in front of us. And I remember being so 
outside of like when am I gonna be happy? When am I gonna? And you couldn't see that you were there. And I was right there. <laughs> yeah. Right there. Yeah. So we're always watching out for the darkness. Yeah, mijo, get all the drinks that you want, you know. And instead, we're not celebrating. We're not. So in, again, present. We go back to being present. Mm-hmm. That's the destination. Being present. Yeah. Uh, for that to happen, you have to. Like you have to run out of place to hide. I guess. Huh. Where are you gonna go? I don't know. I, I can't go. I can't go. Uh, I can't hide behind uh, anti-depression medication. I can't hide behind alcohol. I can't hide behind. But why? You know that's. But why are you hiding? Who do? Who are you hiding from? Myself? We've said yourself. <laughs> but wherever you are, there you are. Wherever you, know, you go, there you are. I don't know. It's a, again. It's a process. When do you feel your truest self? Because it's there. Yeah. Moments. Yeah. When? Uh, usually selfless moments. You know, when I when I see somebody achieve something, uh, and I feel a part of that. That's usually when I, that's when I, that's when I find those moments where I can at least sit with myself for a moment and be happy, you know? And do you ever say, heck yeah, I did that? And, uh, no, because that would be too loving of myself. <laughs> <laughs> I get that, I uh, get that, yeah. right? But uh, I understand, and it's a process, and I am on it. I'm not stuck here. I, 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 uh, I keep a journal, and uh, I, I can, I, every now and then I have this uh, thing where I go back exactly a year in my timeline and look at pictures from exactly where I am in the moment a year ago. And I'm not the same dude. Like you mentioned, a lot of us want to define who we are because of the wound, you know? Yeah. And... Uh, like her process and some of the, the, the conversations we're having right now is part of the process. The conversations I have with many people uh, are part of my process. Um, but it, that finding the jewel in the wound, you know, is still... Yeah, the idea that, okay, you know, I have no idea who I want to be when I grow up, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> And, and the world is our, our oyster, and the world is our playground, and you get to be anything that you want. You get to shit count all of it. Yeah. If you want to. I, I mean, my world's ended a few times over. Right. You know? And, and, uh, and be like, well, you know, I just... I'm redefinition, gonna... rediscovering, finding a new path. Uh, like, uh, I don't know how to interview people. Here I am interviewing right? uh, interviewing you, and we're fig- I'm figuring that out. Before I was uh, showing people how to get out of being tied up and how to weaponize their environment or how to be self-sufficient and survive in awesome environments. Before that, I was actually doing it for, for alive. Before that, I was skateboarding and I wanted to be a doctor. Before that, I was a kid <laughs> somewhere doing some right. ridiculous art that I thought I was going to grow up to be an artist. Uh, so there's all that. Uh, the last, uh, no, talk. This is repetition, but I, uh, the one of one of the the, the the movie scenes that sticks in my mind, you know. Yeah. Uh, Tom Hanks and Castaway at the end of that movie. Ah. Uh. When he's in the crossroads. You know. You talk about trauma. This guy spent all his time on an island, and when he got back, who, who he was. His love, all that. And for me, witnessing that scene was a, holy shit, you know? Um, I lost a marriage, you know? I lost a bunch of friends. This whole giant traumatic experience. Uh, I gained something, you know? Ripped out my heart, put it on the ground your legs and she's eight years old she's running around somewhere out there so that's a gift and I recognize it every day uh, but you know I'm still Gollum coming out of the cave you know <laughs> uh, 
and some of the work you do and some of the work uh, and some of the conversations we have have been of a great help to me. And this one specifically, I think uh, people just witness some of your work in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, I want to thank you for being open to having this conversation. I know a lot of people see the out the edges of this work and who you are and what you do and are maybe skeptical, maybe afraid, yeah. maybe thinking that you are not accessible to people like that. Um, for anybody that wants to get started on their own journey and that wants to reach out to you uh, to help them on on this journey, um, how can they get in contact with you? We have, let's see, oh, we have our website, Black Mesa Remedios. Uh, we have an email option there. That's a good way. I'm on Instagram. I'm not always the best on Instagram. I understand. But yeah, they can email me there. Um, I think that's a good way to do that for now. Yeah. And we, Is it going to be an easy process? No. Eh, no. <laughs> no. No, it's not an easy process. Is it going to be work? Absolutely. Are you gonna make me? Are you gonna make people feel good about themselves? They're gonna walk. Not out. always. And that is the work. And that is the work. And that is the work. If you leave here thinking about something, if you leave here pissed off, then we've done a good job. <laughs> you know, sometimes not everybody leaves pissed off. People usually leave thinking. Yeah. And sometimes they're thinking about something they never thought. Could even be they would they had no idea they were going to be thinking about it. Do people leave here feeling like they could unload every bag of shit that they ever decided to put on? Absolutely. We joke a lot about like I got a pile of bags in the back and <laughs> all the it's my cross to bear. Yeah. We got all the crosses in the back too. Yeah. You know we burn them once a month. <laughs> you know that's that's the work of. Of our medicine people, of our curanderismo people, is to say, leave it here. Yeah. Let me, it's, I got you. If you want to just not pick it up when you leave, you don't have to. Maybe even just, if you only pick up less, then we've, we've done good work. Lisa, for this conversation and for the work you do, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to access this. Um, we're about to go work. We are about to go work. Uh, thank you. <laughs>